William Gibson's Alien 3. You may think you know the full story, but you'd be wrong. So wrong. The abandoned storyline taking place after the events of Aliens has long been the subject of interest to fans, and in recent years Gibson's vision has been brought into further light. Dark Horse Comics adapted the unproduced screenplay, and Audible produced an audio drama adaptation featuring the voice talents of Michael Bean and Lance Henriksen. Now there is a further realization of the story, Pat Cadigan's new novel. It comes with a twist, however, since it was adapted from an earlier version of the Gibson screenplay and features a number of key differences. If you're familiar with the comic and audio drama adaptations, there are moments that will feel and play out in a very recognizable way. But enough is different to make the novel its own unique experience. The more drastic differences become more apparent as the novel progresses. The general story is unchanged, taking place shortly after Ripley, Newt, Hicks, and the damaged android Bishop escape LV-426. The Sulaco drifts into territory claimed by the Union of Progressive Peoples, which sets off a tense arms race against the UPP and Wayland yutani who have each acquired xenomorph biomaterial. The beats setting up the story are just about the same, particularly in the first half. The Sulaco is boarded by UPP personnel who discover Bishop and take his upper torso to Rodina Station. The Sulaco and Bishop's lower torso is retrieved by Wayland yutani and taken to Anchor Point Station, where Hicks and Newt are awakened and Ripley remains in a coma. The action cuts between each station as the experimentation begins. The Bioweapons Division interferes with Anchor Point Station. Things run quickly amuck at Rodina. Newt leaves the story early on a safe passage to Earth to live with her grandparents. Bishop is eventually returned to Anchor Point, repaired, as a gesture of goodwill. When the cloned xenomorph biomaterial is compromised, there is an infection, and we're soon introduced to the hybrid xenomorph, the new beast. In each version, this is a gruesome standout moment that is nicely described in the novel, represented well in the comic book, and unfortunately not able to be fully realized in the audio drama version, for obvious reasons. Nothing probably would have beaten seeing this adapted into a film version, though, especially if it had been made in the 1980s at the peak of practical effects. I'd imagine it could have potentially taken on a legendary status among the likes of John Carpenter's The Thing or David Cronenberg's The Fly, though we'll never know for sure. I think Cadigan's writing does it justice, though. Gruesome but not overbearing, and including an amusing descriptive reference to a famous American painter that really creates an effective visual. But it is in the latter half of the story where things take a different tone. In this version, Anchor Point Station is more lively and more occupied, so much more susceptible to the chaos that an alien outbreak would have to offer. There's more action-focused scenes, and there's more of the inner dwellings of the alien hive that's reminiscent of the James Cameron film. And yes, as the description teases, this version even includes a xenomorph queen, albeit a different and mutated version of a queen. This new type of queen, though not a prominent antagonist, is full of deadly surprises. It's fascinating as a fan to compare the adaptations of the different drafts of Gibson's screenplay. It's clear enough why certain things may have been revised, and I'd probably have to say that overall, the updated story is the better one. However, Cadigan's novel really hones into what works about both. We're given such a rich expansion onto the world that is created here, it feels more realized than ever before. It brings on a better understanding of each station and how they work how the acts and treaties in this universe influence the lives of the characters, and moves beyond what would have once been considered a late 80s Cold War allegory. I think it's something larger than that, and something that's been embraced by the overall extended universe. The UPP has become a presence in the Alien universe despite being introduced in a movie that never actually came to be. We've seen it featured in the Alien 3 adaptations, of course, but it's also made its way largely into the Alien RPG by Free League and the novel Alien into Charybdis by Alex White. And even as recently as being included in the lore of the video game Aliens Fireteam Elite. So if this story isn't necessarily canon and these adaptations are just glimpses into what could have been and nothing more, then at least part of it survives in the overall scheme of things. As with most any novel version of a story, whether it be the source material or an adaptation, it does have the luxury of including additional information without any runtime restrictions. A lot more is added to the world and to the characters. We get inside their heads and understand their histories better. Key characters such as Spence and Tully, for example, who I like just fine in other versions, are given a lot more to work with here, and I gained a higher appreciation for them. 
The same with Luke High, who ultimately offers the strongest character representation of the Rodina Station portions. There's more to Bishop and Hicks as well. There's some additional history to Hicks that I found to be quite interesting. But if I had any criticisms about this novel, it may have to be in the persistent callbacks to aliens. Hicks very often thinks back to his experiences on LV-426 with Ripley and the other Marines, often recalling lines and events we're very well familiar with. This happens maybe a dozen times when I think maybe a handful of these callbacks would have sufficed. But it's a minimal complaint of a novel I otherwise really enjoyed, and a further angle to a lost version of Alien 3 that I've really come to love over the years with all of these adaptations. I think it really keys into what was first hinted at with the first Alien film, and also explored further in Prometheus. The alien as a biological weapon. The fruit of an experiment begun a very long time ago. Perhaps so long ago as to be ancient by our reckoning. A living artifact, genetically engineered to be, first and foremost, a weapon that ends war by ending the enemy. To vanquish a foe, all foes, permanently. This species could be the product of an arms race that escalated while we were still learning to paint on cave walls. It shares the same overall spirit with the other adaptations and retains most of the best working aspects. It has the additional benefits of the novelization, plus all of the differences from the earlier draft. I think that was a smart approach on Titan Books' and Cadigan's part by adapting this different version of the screenplay. So, even if you are well familiar with the comic and with the audio drama, there's a lot of new things to discover here. But now that we have all these different adaptations in different forms, where do we go from here? Are these to amount to just novelties? To what-ifs? Or could this alternate line of continuity, in which Hicks and Bishop become the central characters devoted to destroying the Xenomorph, progress any further? Since Dark Horse adapted the script into its comic version, and Marvel now has the Alien franchise comics rights and seem to be doing their own thing, I don't know if we'd see anything in comic book form. The audio dramas from Audible tend to be adaptations of existing material rather than completely original productions, so while it would be very interesting to see that undertaking, I don't know how likely it would be to happen. Perhaps in novel form would be the best bet, and either Cadigan or other authors may want to explore what would happen next. That would be something I'd welcome with great enthusiasm, but for now it's just wishful thinking. Alien 3 by Pat Cadigan is out on September 7th, today. Though from what I understand it was actually released a week earlier in different parts of the world, such as the UK. Are you planning on checking it out? Are you among the few who's already had the chance? And do you agree that sequels to this Gibson story could be worth exploring? Comment below and let me know what you think. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and be sure to subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very special thanks goes out to Alice Sane and Grizz4756, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorian. A very special thanks goes out to Lady Anne in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence. And in the role of Wayland Yutani Executive, Nanashi FX. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.